Father, we thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. Above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious and redeeming blood, for your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into the truth, who brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus said and indeed shows us things to come. It is with great joy, unspeakable and full of glory that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping. We welcome and invite the supernatural of God to be in manifestation in this service, even as the Spirit wills. Thank you for anointing this vessel of clay to minister life to your people, boldly without fear, favor, or respect of persons, that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth. It will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. Now, Father, we believe that we receive these petitions which we have desired of you. Amen. For we ask them in that mighty, matchless, and majestic name that is above every name, amen. the name of Jesus and all that agreed said amen. amen. They said praise the Lord praise and the Lord. thank God for Jesus. Amen. We'll reach out to a friend or two, praise the Lord, and encourage them for a moment. Amen, amen, and amen. Glory to God. Well, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've been speaking in the early service, I should say, about God's right of possession to our lives. Amen. And with a right of possession, there also comes a right of expectation. <clears throat> For a very simple illustration, I pointed out the fact that any of us who have filled a parental role, your parent, a guardian, maybe you're the big brother or the big sister that had to step in for whatever reason, and under whatever circumstances to, you know, exert parental influence. Well, you know, those you had that influence or that leadership over, you had sort of a right of possession, but also a right of expectation. In other words, if you put a roof over your children's head, food in their bellies, light in their rooms, okay. <clears throat> you, you had certain expectations of them, whether that was in the form of chores, good grades at school, uh, of course, being a good citizen, that, that helps a lot, you know. They're, they're just a good member of the community, so to speak. Well, it's no different in the kingdom of God. Now, understand, I want to remind you again that you and I, as believers, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, yes, I use the word, it only shows up one time in the passage of Scripture in the New Testament uh, because that's what they called them first in the city of Antioch, which is in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And it was not uh, an uplift. <laughs> it was not an affirmation per se. It was a pejorative. As $40 word means, it was a slur. All right? Just like people would use the N word or whatever other word they used to, you know, vilify one ethnic group or another. That was the original use of the word. But actually, its literal meaning is to be like Christ. Amen. So, what's wrong with that? Oh, Nothing. Yeah. In fact, the Bible says it another way. In Ephesians 5.1, it says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Amen. And it says to us, we should mimic our Father. Now, Amen. as I've said, you're not going to hurl another celestial body into the solar system. You're not going to put another star up in the sky. But essentially, you are speaking spirit, just like your heavenly Father. And uh, the Bible says that as he is, so are we in this world. And so we need to learn to master and major what I call the intangibles because God has full reign over those. Amen. Now, he's the God that created the heavens and the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all them that dwell therein. He is indeed that. So, you know, he has the mastery over all things physical, but he also has the mastery over all things spiritual. And that, that's where we, <laughs> that's why we're in the, what we call a school of continuous learning. Because for the most part, upon our arrival here in this earth, we 
we are very much aware of things around us, but not necessarily things within us. And, you know, I'm talking about like the invisible kinds of things, the intangibles. See, there's stuff you can't go in the grocery store and buy. You can't go into the Home Depot or any other retail outlet and buy by the pound or the linear foot or whatever the metric is. Uh, how do you go to the grocery store and say, look, you know, I'd like a half pound of honesty? <laughs> Quarter ounce of uh, dependability? <laughs> you know, uh, give, me, give me a couple of sacks of trust over there, okay? No, no, no. The Bible talks about something called the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. In fact, before we move on a little bit further, how about let's go over there. Galatians chapter 5. Now, there are listed here in this epistle written by Paul to the Gal church of Galatia, nine specific fruit of the Spirit. Amen. And Paul parallels or helps us to understand what this is, because when you think about fruit, you, you almost naturally think about trees. Amen. You know, I remember the man who was blind and, you know, was getting his sight back, and he said, first... He said, I see men as trees. <laughs> and then the Lord hit him again, and then he said, oh, I see everything clearly. But you know, there's a little parallel to us being trees, because fruit does not spring out of the trunk of the tree. It manifests on the branches. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I am the vine, and you are the what? You are the branches. So this fruit, or this spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, should be being produced on us, Amen. the branches, or shall I say within us. Okay, so we pick it up here at the 22nd verse, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Paul's writing, he said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first thing leading the list. Amen. Joy, yes. peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then most critical, it says against such there is no law. You can grow as much of this fruit or cultivate it as much as you want. There's no law against it. Amen. In other words, there's no natural or even human law that can negate this fruit of the Spirit. That's what he's telling you. Amen. He said against such there is no law. The law of Moses is not against it. Civil law cannot prevail against it. These things are very, very powerful here. Now, you can subdivide the fruit of the Spirit into three categories. The first three deal with our relationship with God. The second three deal with our relationship with others, our peers. And that could be our family, our coworkers, our partners, what, you know. And then the, the final three deal with our relationship with ourselves. Amen. So let's look at it. Love, joy, and peace. Now remember, all of these things are intangible. Amen. You, they're not three-dimensional. They don't have height and width and depth. They don't, they don't have mass and weight. Amen. They're, they're intangible. Okay. So that, in other words, these things function out of the realm of of what we consider to be the natural. Uh, truly, these are supernatural in essence. Amen. So love, joy, and peace, that comes as a result of developing our relationship with God, Amen. strengthening that. We, we have an abundant, the Bible even says that the love of God is poured forth into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. This is this God kind of love. It's the unconditional love because that's, that's the only thing that relates with God in us, Amen. his unconditional love. That is a, a, a concept, unfortunately, too foreign to many people, many humans. They, it's, it's challenging sometimes, not always, but to find people who love in an unconditional way. Amen. Although there have been some very, very public examples where horrific things have happened, and the people who were disadvantaged by those things or uh, were, were robbed or, you know, deprived of whatever 
find within themselves the ability to forgive, Amen. to love rather than hate, Amen. in spite of the circumstances. Man, you and I both know certain domestic situations that have existed either far from us or close to us that just went sideways. They say the relationship went south. And you, you got people divorcing and breaking up and splitting up and say, I can't stand the sight of that person. I, I can't stand the sound of their voice. I, I don't want anything to do with them anyway. I just hate them. You know, that's something that, uh, yeah, I'm going to get into this thing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's something that has really, I believe, done serious damage to the fabric of our culture, to the fabric of our nation. Unbridled hate is a dangerous thing. Amen. But unconditional love, because see, listen, I can tell you about love. God is love. First John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. God is love. He that loveth is born of God, knoweth God. But he that loveth not, the Bible says, knoweth not God. In other words, they don't have an intimate fellowship or relationship with God. Why? Because God is love. So what does that tell you? Love is the absolute solution, Amen. the remedy, yes. the provision, Amen. the protection yes. of everything that pertains to us. Amen. And it is certainly one of the intangibles that you will more or less be tested in more often than not. Amen. The degree to which you love. And see, I'm going to tell you something. Loving others has nothing to do with how they treat you or how they love you. Now, no, no, listen, the, the proof, listen, the proof of that pudding is God so loved the world. Does anybody see much lovable in this world? There are some things. There's some people. And see, it, it, it gets down to people. You, you see, these nine fruit of the Spirit are irrelevant to any inanimate thing you've got. They're only relevant when it comes down to interaction with God, with others, and with yourself. And like any fruit, even in the natural, has to be cultivated. There's things you have to do. Seed has to be planted. Watering has to be done. You might have to get rid of some things that would otherwise impede the natural growth or development Amen. of the fruit. Amen. That's why I was saying to you, you'll get tested in these things more than anything else. I, I dare say, well, actually, you'll be tested in all nine. You'll be tested in the development of that fruit where it concerns your relationship with God. You'll be tested in development of the fruit in which it relates to others. You will be tested in the fruit in which it relates to yourself. Yeah, you, you can really get pretty well jacked up with yourself. So let's look at this. So, so love, this unconditional love. Yes, God so loved the world. So it's obvious. God's love was not dependent on being loved back. Paul wrote, and he said, you know what? While we were yet dead in our trespasses, didn't say anything about they belong to God, said our trespasses. And in our sins, God sent Jesus to die for us. You see, the kind of love that God produces and, and, and what he is, is not love, as I said, based on whether you get love back. It's love that is provided for the benefit of another. And most especially when the one benefited is disadvantaging themselves. Whoa, you can unpack that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's the reason why, like, the institution of family, which is certainly of God, and all these crazy improvisations and redefinitions of what family is, what fathers are, what mothers are, what children are, and all this nonsense you see going on out here. You remember, for uh, some time ago, I began, uh, you know, teaching about doctrines of devils. Amen. You know, the Bible said that in the latter times, some shall do what? Depart from the faith. Can't leave a place you hadn't first arrived. Amen. 
And the reason why people depart from the faith is quite plain and simple in Scripture. It says they're listening to or giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Or another way of stating that is doctrines that devils teach. Most people think false doctrines and doctrines of demons somehow spontaneously generate out of a church that's moving in a cultish direction or going off away from the center of Scripture. Uh, not necessarily so. Now, if they are going off in a cult or they're going off in, off center of the Word, then for sure some doctrine of a demon has slipped in there someplace. All right? Understand what I'm saying. Uh, but, but nevertheless, doctrines of demons can come in a number of ways. Amen. School curriculum. Amen. Legislation, yes, drafted by Congress. Amen. Because the, the part of our government called Congress are the individuals responsible, or I should say the collective body, responsible for making laws. Amen. They make the laws, Congress does. The Senate and the House of Representatives. The Supreme Court interprets the law Amen. to ensure constitutionality. Yeah, I'm going to give you a Civics 101 class for a second. The President of the United States, who is heads up the executive branch, it's his responsibility to enforce the laws. Because in the Department of the Executive Branch, or I should say in, under the Executive Branch, are a number of departments including the law enforcement agencies like the FBI, Amen. the military operations like the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, and so forth and so on. They all come under that. But see, it's checks and balances that are involved in that. No one branch has absolute power. And yet the framers were very careful to balance those powers in a way so that nobody just ran off with it. Now, I think you need to know that doesn't mean somebody won't or won't try. Okay. But, and, and again, I'm, I'm just speaking, to, and ladies and gentlemen, when I talk to you like this, I'm coming from the Spirit of God Amen. and from the Scripture. I'm not coming from the political left Amen. or the political right. I'm not even coming from the political center. Because, see, all three of those positions are human in origin. Amen. Government, in essence, is truly of God. That nothing exists, ladies and gentlemen, that God doesn't permit to exist. See, see God is righteous in all his dealings and doings. He says... He, he creates the heavens and the earth. Then he says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and, and let him have dominion. Man, that's the ultimate delegation. God said, leave him in charge. Let him run this place. Give him a place to run. It's called earth. And in a sense of speaking, God gave a lease to the man. And, you know, you're not going to, don't go to the, local jurisdiction to try to find the paperwork. Amen. Okay, that's right. But there's a lease on the thing. Right. And we're the leaseholders. Well, God's the leaseholder, okay? We're the lessees. Amen. We're the ones operating on the lease. Now, come on, people can relate to that at one point or another. Maybe some of you, you, you leased apartments, leased condos, whatever, these lease houses, you know, you had an arrangement going on. Uh, well, that's the way that we operate in this world because, see, that's why Jesus said in the prayer he taught his disciples, uh, as it is in heaven, amen, amen. let it be so in the earth. Amen. So that this is an outpost. This is a satellite of heaven. This is a colony of heaven. Amen. I know that's a rough word in the minds of a lot of people because when you think in terms of colonization, you think in terms of one coming along, and basically appropriating your culture and this and that and exchanging it for something else. And yes, indeed, that has happened. But you know why? Mainly because there was a violation of the original five-fold mandate that God provided in the lease. Amen. He said, now let them have dominion, okay? And he said, now over the fish, the fowls, the cattle and beasts, 
Amen, all the creeping things, right? That's what he said. He never mentioned a person, never mentioned humanity, all right? And, and then he said, the way to do this is to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and, and have dominion over it. That was God's total delegation. Th those are the terms of the least. Amen. Just go in human history and check everywhere that man violated the least. What happens when you violate yours? Well, the landlord comes along and says, man, you, did, you, know, you didn't keep this up. You, this was broken. This, uh, you, know, you, you had certain responsibilities you're supposed to carry out. At the very least, call us at, at the maintenance shack to come in and fix something. Don't just let the plummet, the pipes go burst in the cold and you say nothing because we got to pay for that water that's run out there and then got to fix the pipes on top of it. So, I mean, and that's a natural example. But see, the, the reason why we have the chaos, calamity, and confusion that we have right now is because there have been violations on the lease that God has given humanity. And the Bible really outlines and reveals to us the terms of the lease. And it's funny that when you do the right thing, okay, when you do what is written in the Word, it's, amazing, you, it's not a guarantee against issues and troubles. To be honest with you, it also reveals how you can troubleshoot trouble. Now you can be rid of it. Amen. Amen. I love the promises, too, that say no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against me, I will condemn, for this is my heritage as a servant of God, and my righteousness is of God. Listen, that is as valid and as true as all the rights and privileges that the Bill of Rights of the Constitution of the United States gives me as a United States citizen. And if you really want to know the truth, the things that, re that are revealed about me in God's Word that are revealed about you as His children, as His people, as His citizens of His kingdom are as true, if not even more so. You know why? Because just like these fruit of the Spirit and many other intangible things, they, they have the ability to pass into eternity with us. Remember, we're spirits that have souls. And those are the only two components of us that get to leave this planet and go into the country called heaven. Amen. That part of us that was made from the dust of the ground returns right. to the ground from whence it came. Amen. The other major parts of us, the spirit and the soul, go back to God who gave it. Amen. That's why it's even more important to develop, as I said, these intangibles, these fruits of the spirit, and other things that, than anything else. So back to the same. So love, unconditional of God. Agape is the Greek word. In the verb form, it's translated agapeo. It, it, God so loved the world. Amen. That's love put into action. Amen. Unconditional love. Because as Paul wrote, he said that while we were yet dead in trespasses and sins, yet God loved us. He sent Jesus to die for us. We must never forget that. Then it talks about joy. Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord Amen. is our strength. I want to show you something. Look, listen. Thank you. Love is, listen, the love of God is not dependent on being loved back. Amen. And joy, this joy here, has nothing to do with what you call happiness. Amen. Happiness is something you decide to do. I'm happy because. I'm happy because. But joy? You can have joy when nobody's happy. You, you, listen to me. Oh, get ready for this. You can have joy when you're not even happy. Because joy and happiness are two entirely different things. Now, I remember that fellow wrote that song, Happy, you know. And he talked about, he start, you know, in the song through the lyrics, I don't know all the lyrics, I'm just saying, in the song he seems to be describing, he says, what makes him happy. So in other words, if any of those things he says makes you happy aren't there, you're no longer happy. But when you have joy, 
that the Bible talks about joy unspeakable and full of glory. When you talk about the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, whether you're happy or not, if you sustain joy, when you understand by faith and appropriate faith that I have the joy of the Lord in my life, it will give you the strength to overcome your unhappy condition. Joy is something that can sustain you when there's all kind of nonsense going on outside of you. We just passed through an incredible storm near the time that I'm bringing this message. It just passed by us this past weekend here. And uh, look, let me tell you something. Storms belong outside. When they get in you, you got a problem. Now, you might say, Pastor, that's just ridiculous. And who would want a hurricane in them? And yet there's a lot of folks housing hurricanes, housing tornadoes, housing thunderstorms. Housing lightning strikes. Housing high humidity. High temperature. And some folks just stone cold. Why? Because they've allowed conditions out there to get in here. And no one has created a greater insular than God. <laughs> you say, how do you illustrate that? John, 1 John 4 and 4. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. You know, it's a funny thing. Nothing can come from the outside, come inside you where the greater one lives and get him out of there. No, you didn't catch that. That's why y'all looking at me like that. See, nothing, think about that. Nothing out there can come in and dispossess, dislodge, dismiss Amen. Amen. The Holy Ghost on the inside of you. No. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Man, listen to me. If he's greater than anything else than anybody else, who's going to come and displace him? But see, you, listen to me. You have the oversight. You have the stewardship over you. That's why the Bible says, quench not the spirit. It's not talking about something from the outside coming in and doing that. It's talking about you. Amen. Quench not the spirit. Don't dampen, diminish, or dilute Amen. what his purpose is in your life, Amen. what he's trying to do in you. Because if there's any, listen, if there's anyone who can help you cultivate the fruit of the spirit, it's the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, when it says, but the fruit of the spirit, now I need to go back for a minute. And let's, let's define that. Let's look at that. This is not the fruit of the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is the fruit of you, the human spirit. This, this fruit appears on we, the branches, as a result of our direct relationship and engagement with the person of the Holy Spirit. There's no natural soil that can cultivate this fruit. Amen. You can't go to Pike's Nursery and get anything for this. Now you might get a few green plants and some flowers, and what will they do? They'll make you happy. You plant them out there, they're colorful, you like them, you water them, you know, gives you a little sense of purpose. That's, that's nothing wrong with that at all. These people look like they're trying to build the Garden of Eden all over again. I've seen them. That's great. But all those plants and flowers are dependent on everything out there, everything that's weighed and measured, but not this fruit. Love, joy, joy, a source of strength. That's how powerful this is. It can strengthen you. Joy can bring strength to you. You can have joy in the midst of trouble. A joy unspeakable, unspeakable and full of glory. You may not always speak it out. But you ought to. Amen. Well, when someone's trying to rob you of your joy or your happiness or whatever it is, just say, I have the joy of the Lord. Amen. And I decree and declare according to God's word, because you can confess what the word says. Hold fast to your confession of faith. I have the joy of the Lord, and nothing's going to take it away from me. Amen. And then it talks about peace, which is also illustrated by Paul as a peace of God, 
The pastors don't understand it. I like to say it doesn't make any sense. You know why? Because it isn't dependent on sense. With all the nonsense that's going on in the world around us and in our culture, we can sustain and, in fact, continue to cultivate all three of these we just talked about. Why? Because it, they, they deal with our relationship with God. As we remain connected in fellowship and engagement with God through prayer, through worship, through what I call our spiritual vital signs, Amen. love is in abundant supply. Joy, you, listen, you have a bumper crop of all this. Love, joy, and peace. Peace that passes all understand. Doesn't make any sense. How can people be in the middle of chaos, calamity, and confusion and have peace? That's what all those folks in the world that are confused, do not understand the scripture, don't know God, they ought to be looking at you and say, how come you're not pulling out your hair? Why aren't you at the end of your rope? Why aren't you ready to give it all up? Because I have a peace that passes all understanding. How do you get that peace? Isaiah tells you, 26 chapter, third verse is now, he keeps him, he being God. He keeps you at perfect peace. Why? Because you stay with your mind on him. Because you trust in him. I trust God for his unconditional love. I trust God for his joy. I trust God for his peace that passes all understanding. The more I read about God, the more I listen to the spirit within me, the more I, I pick up on the inward witness of God's spirit inside me uh, to remind me again and again. Because I want to tell you something. God knows where you are. Knows what you're dealing with. Knows where he finds you. He may find, listen, you say, boy, I find myself in a maelstrom of difficulties and issues. I have family issues. I have financial issues. I have physical issues. I have all kinds of issues going on in my life. And, and you know what I'll tell you, the greatest, the, the first temptation that comes along is, where's God? Amen. He hadn't left where he's been. Amen. What did he promise you? I heard somebody say, say he'll never leave you, Amen. nor forsake you. Even to the end of the world, when people are acting crazy, he said, I'll never leave you. Uh, you're not ready for this. Even when you doubt yourself and you doubt God and you doubt your own sanity, he still won't leave you. When you're tearing up everything and botching up everything and screwing up everything, he still isn't going anywhere. Amen. There's a lot of people that think, well, you know, uh, uh, if, if, I, if I don't act right, God's going to leave me. No, you don't have scripture for that. Amen. No, you don't. Amen. You, you don't have anything that can negate a promise from God. Amen. When he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, how are you going to do that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. God even said, you know, I look at your culture, I look at your human government and this and that and the other. In, in the first chapter of Proverbs, he said, you know what, I'm going to have a good laugh here because I told you all how to do this, but you insisted on doing your own thing. And now you got what you got. And, and, and see, here's the thing about God. God says, you know, I'm standing by. I'm still, what was that song we used to sing? The Lord is standing by. Y'all remember that old song in the church? The, the, the tune is evading my mind, but I hear it singing in my mind here, you know. God is standing by. I hear it, though. I, I can hear it. Right, he's standing by. And I mean, listen, he's not just standing by idle, doing nothing. That's not God. And then if that's not enough, he's also provided angelic assistance. Amen. Scripture tells us, be careful how you entertain strangers. Some have entertained angels unaware. So that tells me a number of things. If you, if you unpack that, angels of some come out and say, hi, I'm an angel. It also tells me that angels look like most everybody else. Amen. And here's the thing. They, listen, it, when they take on like, like human form or whatever, because they, listen, you have to understand, angelic hosts, 
uh, bear in uncanny resemblance to self. That's why the Bible says, be careful how you entertain strangers. You, you, in other words, the only thing is, you don't know who this person is. That's why they're a stranger to you. But they could be an angel. Now, you know, if there's a string of cuss words coming out of their mouth, you know they ain't no angel. <laughs> right. You know, if they're trying to con you, <clears throat> pardon me, or rip you off, you know, that's no angel. Right? He said, well, man, pastor, how can I be 100% sure? that there's an angel dealing with me. But that's, that's, that goes back to the simplicity of walking with God. That goes back to the, the, the basics of, you know, being sensitive and aware of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, if he can bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God, he can also bear witness with your spirit that you're dealing with an angelic host. Amen. Let's stop overcomplicating this thing. Let's stop putting, you know, rocket science to this. It's not rocket science. Amen. I have certainly had an encounter, and maybe more than one, with angelic Amen. assistance. Amen. Almost always when people are under the operation or under the manifestation of the gift of faith, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, oftentimes angelic assistance is deployed. Amen. One of the most classic cases, and I've taught this a thousand times, was when the three Hebrew young men went into the fiery furnace and a fourth man appeared in the furnace. Now, now see, you got to look at this. Nebuchadnezzar said, oh my God, look at this guy. There's a fourth man in the fiery furnace, but I know we only put three in there. And then, and then the fourth looks like a son of God. Now, you know, man, when, I, when you back into that, I have to ask myself, Nebuchadnezzar, what do you know? about what a son of God looks like. How, were, how could you discern the difference between the three young men and the fourth man in the fiery furnace? What have you been dealing with? Or, or, or who have you been dealing with? Well, I can tell you one fellow he'd been dealing with was Daniel. Because see, Daniel, Daniel was able to survive three administrations, Nebuchadnezzar's, Belshazzar's, and Darius the Mede. He, and you know, this is the thing. When you read the Bible, somehow or another, you capsulize yourself into an hour. You look and read at this stuff, and you don't know that from one verse to another, you might jump five years. Or you might jump five months or five weeks, whatever. But see, a lot of times when you read these things, well, you say, well, that just happened this moment, that moment. But, but these are real people that live life on an ongoing and daily basis just like you and I do. Amen. They got to go to work in the morning. They got to eat. They got to rest. These are people. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar was a man even though he was king of Babylon. Right. Belshazzar, same thing. Darius, all these rulers and leaders, pharaohs of Egypt, they were all humans. Amen. Regardless of their position and authority in the political realms in which they, they reigned and ruled, they're people. Time, they, listen, they were subject to all things that humans are subject to. Temperature, time, all these things. So I wondered, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, how do you know the difference? But all I'm saying is this. You see, those young men, they went in there, and the reason I know that God manifested through them the gift of special faith is because when that's in operation, it enables you to sustain an unwavering trust in God for supernatural provision, protection, and even proclamation. When prophets would speak in the Old Testament, like Elijah said, it will not rain for the space of whatever it was, 36 months, whatever, two and a half years, whatever. Listen, just for him to open his mouth and declare that, and decree that without wavering in trust in God that it would come to pass exactly as he said it. He's functioning under the gift of special faith. Amen. When the Bible says desire earnestly the best gifts, most folks don't have a clue. Everybody wants the spectacular stuff. Man, give me the gift of working of miracles. I, I want to I experience the gift of the, the gifts of healings. And, and I, I tell you what. 
The gift of faith it enables you to receive a miracle from God. Listen, when they've tied you up and they're about to throw you into a burning, fiery furnace, you don't have any remedy. There's nothing you can grab for or reach for to prevent this. But when you speak as these young men spoke to the king and said, we don't even have to think about this twice. Your majesty, you ask, who is that God that will deliver us from out of your hand? We don't have to think twice about that. Not only is our God capable of doing it. Wait a minute. Here's where the gift of faith comes in. He will do it. He will do it. Now, even in that bold declaration, they still tied him up and threw him in the furnace. But something happened. Nothing happened to the furnace. Nothing happened to the fire. But something happened to those young men. God's power came in there. God dispatched an angel. Just like he did for Daniel. They threw Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel had violated the law of the Medes and the Persians, which the scripture describes as that which altereth not. You can't change it. You can't appeal it. The king himself couldn't do it. How dumb is that? Anyway, he couldn't do it. He's about, listen to me, he's about to throw away one of the, the most loyal, most dedicated, most competent, most capable men in his cabinet over some vanity foolishness. Wanting to be a God worship for 30 days. Think about that. That's what brought Daniel to that, the threshold of destruction. They threw him in there, man. And listen, Daniel went in there. He didn't cry, scream, and kick anything. The Bible doesn't say anything about him lamenting and wailing and carrying on. He went down in there, and the lions were down there. That's where they kept him. But then we find out what happened. Daniel comes out and says, my God, send his angel. And close the mouths of the lions. Therefore, they did not do any hurt to me. The king then called all of his accusers and said, bring them, throw them and their families and everything they've got down in the den. And the Bible, the, everybody say, the Bible says. Well, the Bible said that the lions broke every bone in their bodies before they ever hit the bottom of the pit. That boy, I tell you what, those are some supernatural lions. And they were supernaturally hungry too. I want to tell you something. Don't mess with God. Don't mess with God's people. Amen. I, I know this, this, this is a tough one here, but I told you I, I'm going to be led by spirit. What, what you see going on, on the, uh, uh, what I call the geopolitical landscape right now, is I don't know what you think. This is a clear demonstration on God's prophetic timeline that's going on. Everybody's upset about the, the, the disturbances in the Middle East and Israel doing this and doing that and so forth and so on. I, time will not permit me in this segment to be able to unpack all that to everybody's satisfaction. But then again, can I explain something to you? It ain't about your satisfaction. It's not about my satisfaction. It's not about the political people's satisfaction. It, it's not about any ethnic group's satisfaction. It's not about any nation's satisfaction. It's about what thus saith the Lord. The Lord told you this is what you can expect to happen. He's, Jesus himself said, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. Now, no man knows the day or the hour when all that, the return of Jesus is going to be. No, no man knows the day or the hour. But Jesus did say, here, here's some clothes though, that let you know that the return is near. And whether you know it or not, want to believe it or not, because you know what, I feel sometimes like I'm talking to people like Noah spoke to the people of his age. No, I'm not comparing you to those nut, nut jobs. Those people were stone knuckleheads, man. A man of God preaches righteousness for 120 years, and none of them got it. The only people that was put in that ark was Noah, his wife, his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their three wives. And that was it. Amen. 
and God shut the door. Amen. He didn't leave any man right. to shut that door. Man, not even Noah. Noah might have looked out there, those people screaming and treading water and said, well, wait a minute, I'll I, I let you come in. No, he didn't drop a rope or nothing, man. God closed that door and nobody could open it. Amen. Which goes to show you that God can close doors no man can open. And God can open doors that no man can close. And I'm telling you, that's real pertinent truth that you can live by day to day right now. So going back to my original premise, I'm saying, sometimes I feel like I'm talking to people like that. See, don't ever get that way. Amen. That's what the Lord said. Look, it's going to be that way. What does he mean by that? They're going to be doing the usual stuff they're doing. They're going to be in business as usual. Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, planning and building and all that kind of stuff. That's what they're doing now. Look at the cranes all over our skyline down there. They're just building like there's no tomorrow. Not knowing when Jesus himself could split the eastern sky. And in the meantime, while we're, ma listen, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, planning and building, and all this chaos, calamity, and confusion starts going, God's prophetic timeline is in motion, Amen. is engaged. Don't, listen, if you attempt to lower what's going on over there in the Middle East or any other part of the world, you try to lower that into the realm of men's political thinking, you're going to miss God. Amen. Politics is about human government. God is, he's not political in the way we think of politics. Though he is known to be king of kings and lord of lords, both of those titles are political titles. A king is a chief politician. A lord is a chief politician. And he's, he's it on both counts. King of kings and lord of lords. The church itself, translated from the Greek word ekklesia, meaning a governing council. Whoa. Because that is ultimately the only goal. God always wanted us to be theocratically functioning. That was his original idea and plan for Adam and for the entire human race. And that, that see, listen, if we'd function like that, if Adam had functioned the way, man, I, I get into some things, folks, and I got to find a way out. <laughs> Amen. Because what, what I'm trying to say is this. If Adam had not, if Adam and Eve, yeah, let me put them both in the way, had not eaten the forbidden fruit. You know what life would be like for us now? No, you don't. You have no earthly idea. But when you look at what we do have now, you, you can imagine, boy, I'd like anything but this. You're getting a little bit closer to what Eden should have been like and what the, the world and the race of humanity should be like. Amen. Amen. I, li I like to go in there. I like to talk about that. I like to think about that because it's just awesome. So see, when, when, when we as citizens of the kingdom of heaven actually arrive in the country called heaven, it's more than enough, my brothers and sisters, to wipe away, to wipe out Every fear, every anxiety, every pain, every difficulty, every complication, every issue you ever had in your life, no matter what the degree of that was, it's that strong. And, and listen, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, I got go to I gotta go to the other side of the equation there. Hell and the lake of fire is more than enough. Judgment, punishment for just flat out evil and, more, and most particularly the rejection of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the Savior of the world, because that essentially is what sends people to hell. They send themselves. Well, how? By rejecting Jesus. Refusing to acknowledge. I told you the indictment from Romans 1 had nothing to do with what people did. It had everything to do with what people didn't do. 
And when they refuse to recognize and honor God as God, that's a sin of omission. They knew to do good and they didn't do it. Now I know we bring it to all these different things that we deal with in our day-to-day -day lives, but I'm gonna tell you, that's the major issue and why that indictment was brought by God in Romans 1. He said, the reason you all go into all these crazy, cultish, perverse, this and that and the other, the reason why you have lost direction, you can't define men and women anymore, you can't define family anymore, you can't define boys and girls and gender and you, you, this, that, and the other. The reason why you all stuck calling good evil and calling evil good is because you neglected, you failed to recognize God as God and give him the honor that, and the, the worship that's due him. Amen. And see, here's the thing. You know human being and the judgment day is going to stand before God and accuse him of being unfair or unjust. Amen. You know what? By literal definition, he can't be either. He can't be unfair. And it isn't about fairness. And, and he, but listen, for sure, he can't be unjust. Because he can't be unrighteous. Amen. He can't be. Amen. He cannot be Jehovah Sekenu, the Lord, our righteousness. He can't be righteousness and unrighteousness at the same time. Amen. That would cancel him out. He can't be that. Folks, let's, let's wade in the water here just a minute. He can't be that. So what I'm trying to tell you, nobody's going to stand and, and accuse God. God, you didn't treat me right. God, it was unjust of you to condemn me and this and that and that. No, 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 no. Because, see, here's the thing. When God said, let's make man our own image and after our likeness, that's exactly what he did. So what did he do? He built into every human the capability to worship. You see, just like when you get thirsty and you get hungry, and you go after something to eat and drink? Let me explain something to you. God made humanity in such a way that there is an innate, meaning at birth, desire to worship. It's there. It comes with you when you arrive. That's why you can't accuse God. And see, the thing is, and I don't know how he did it. If I did, I'd be him. How in the world does he create uh, an entire human race that has uh, free moral agency, the ability to choose and decide between alternatives? How do you do that? You know, we, they're trying to still map out the human brain. They still haven't done that. They can't figure all that stuff out. They know some stuff, but they don't know everything. They know just enough to be dangerous, but they don't know everything. So how do you make people? Uh, with free moral will and this and that and the other. And see, the problem is, it, it, where the issue comes in is that there's a competitor for our worship. Mm -hmm. Go read Matthew 4 and 4, where Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know why he said that? Because the devil came to him and said, if you're the son of God, command these stones be made bread. If you're the son of God, it, you know, he took him up on the pinnacle of the temple, said, jump down. Because it's written, he's given the angels charge to keep you from dashing your foot against the stone. And then he said, you know what? All these kingdoms of men, will I give them uh, and, and their glory to you if you'll just do what? Bow down, Bow down and what? Worship. Worship me. He makes that same presentation, ladies and gentlemen, to everybody, to everybody. He tempts you in the flesh. He tempts you in your soul. And he'll tempt you in your spirit to convince you to worship him or to worship anything but God. Why? Because he knows. He even knew a son of God has power to command. But he knows every human being has the innate ability to worship. And it's an appetite. It's a genuine appetite, just like hunger and thirst and a desire for knowledge. Because that's what messed up man in the Garden of Eden. The devil accused him, remember? Yeah, God knows that you'll be his gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, he's hiding something from you. He's keeping something back from you. God didn't keep anything back from you. But 
it's our responsibility to keep ourselves back from evil. Amen. What do we say in that prayer? Lead us not into temptation. Yeah, there's a reason that's written in there. There's a reason Jesus taught his disciples that. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. My friends, I'm never finished. I just have to stop. And here's a good stopping point. Praise God. And I believe God that this word, this message, has been used by God to be a source of inspiration, encouragement, blessing, and practical instruction for everyday living in your life. But it all begins by establishing a relationship with God through his son and our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So whoever you are, wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, when I say you don't know him, that is to say you have no real intimate knowledge of him. You are not in what I call ongoing fellowship with him. You've not received him and acknowledged him as Savior and the Lord of your life. Well, we want to lead you in a special prayer right now that will help usher you into that place. Amen. So bow your head, close your eyes, just cut off all distractions right now and pray this prayer and say, Dear God, in heaven I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer right there with us, I want to say congratulations to you. We lovingly welcome you into the family of God. Yes, you have passed from death unto eternal life. You have left the kingdom of darkness, and now you have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, which means you're now officially a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with all the rights, privileges, practices, and principles thereunto. Now, that said, this is an entirely new thing. Why? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. 